Hi everyone, it's Paul Yeager. Welcome inside the MTOM studios here at Iowa PBS in Johnston, Iowa. And we are in the middle of spring weather season. I won't say we're in the middle of Tornado Alley. That is up for debate about where that's going. But we're also in the area where people go and sometimes find tornadoes. We had one in Des Moines, close to where we filmed this. In early March, that's kind of unheard of. We're going to talk today about those that chase the storms, how they know where to go, kind of trust their gut, but also look at the science and making up a decision before they head in with a still or video camera, and what data they hope to find and can help others as we look at spring storms. So we're talking with a storm chaser today. Melanie Metz is out of Minneapolis, out of the Minnesota state and she is going to tell us about how she got involved in this uh, and also uh, you might go that name's familiar well she was a star of a, a reality show called twister sisters we'll talk about that and we'll talk about safety and knowledge and also a new endeavor that she's involved with called girls who chase that's this installment of the podcast if you have any feedback or ideas on who i should talk to hit me up at paul.yeager at iowapbs.org I look forward to hearing from you and enjoy this episode of the podcast. Was the movie Twister like one of those things that was like a lifelong set you on your path? Oh, the movie Twister, I think just validated for me that storm chasing is a thing. Honestly, I was interested in tornadoes and seeing a tornado and chasing storms since I was really young living in Arizona but throughout my childhood, I never met anybody else that was really passionate about it. So when the movie Twister came out, it was like, what? Really? Like, there's other people out there who like this stuff and who are even doing research in that field. Even though it was just a movie and it was fictional, there were a lot of elements of it that were kind of real, somewhat realistic when you, we take a look at the chaser community that's out there now and the different research that's being done. Well, Back in the day, um, just... One more thing, back in the day, you know, we didn't have social media. We didn't have Facebook and Twitter and all these places where we could connect with other people out there that had the same interests. So I only had my small group of friends around me. Nobody else was interested in that stuff. <laughs> well, and that's how you find your lane. You go, that is, that's, that's why it's so fun to, we all have our own individual paths. Now, I will tell you that, well, I don't need to tell you, you know this, but Twister, some of it was filmed in Iowa, and I've I've been through the towns where they filmed, and I remember when it came out, um, traveling with some friends, and we came across a flipped over red Dodge truck that's like used in the movie. We're like, oh, it's Twister, it's right here in real life. But <laughs> yes, it, it sticks with us. Uh, mm -hmm. But that type of a movie, when you say it it, 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 it clicked with you. You said you grew up in Arizona. Are there many tornadoes in Arizona? No, that's the funny thing. There aren't any tornadoes in Arizona. I shouldn't say never, but usually not. We definitely had a lot of dust devils, so little vortices, you know, dust spinning up in the air. Um, but definitely nothing like a big tornado out there. Out there in Arizona, we, though, we did have a lot of lightning. So they have the monsoon season, and you get a lot of really cool, intense lightning and thunderstorms. I was always definitely fascinated by that as well. And for some reason, I would just dream about tornadoes. I don't know where it came from. I don't think it came from a movie, personally. Sometimes I wonder if maybe it was a past life or something. <laughs> no, you never know. So know. how do you get from Arizona to Minnesota? Well, when I was young, my parents got divorced. My mother ended up moving to Minnesota when I was in high school. And at that time, I ended up moving with her. Um, so yeah, I ended up in Minnesota basically because my mom moved here back in high school, and that was a long time ago, back in 1989. So I've been in Minnesota quite a while. And it was pretty exciting for me to move to Minnesota because then I got to experience real severe weather. When the sky turns dark and green and the tornado sirens go off, I definitely was a little nervous when that happened for the first time, but I was also pretty excited. I really wanted to get out there and see the storm, but I did take shelter because I didn't quite yet know how to safely be out there and watch the storm. I'm not trying to backdate and figure out your age. I'm just saying, <laughs> what age were you when you were real? You realized that, uh, yes, the sky is green, the 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 ingredients are there. A storm could happen. Mm -hmm. I want to go after it. 
I feel like it just was pretty natural for me to be able to identify when the weather was becoming severe. Um, and also I was always watching the weather channel. I was always watching radar. So I had a sense of what was coming based on just the forecast as well, since I was always listening and watching that. Um, I was probably, well, let's see, at about 15 years old when I really started to pay more attention to the weather and to the storms and the forecasts and started to learn a little bit on my own at that time. Was then meteorology something you pursued after high school? What's interesting is I loved meteorology and I definitely wanted to get out there and watch the storms. I was also very interested in all of the sciences and photography. Photography was my other passion. So in high school, I actually, I took photography and I was the yearbook photographer. I was developing film in the dark room, all that fun stuff before the digital era. Um, and at that time, I ended up taking all the science classes that they had to offer at, in my high school. I ended up winning an award for it. And I, I didn't do it intentionally. I just loved all of it. So I was really um, not quite exactly sure what path I wanted to take. However, I did definitely want to learn meteorology. When I went to college, I did end up taking some meteorology courses and along with a bunch of other science courses, I ended up actually majoring in chemistry and biomedical science. However, I did also do a chunk of education with photography and meteorology. So I learned how to forecast. I learned a bunch of stuff. I just didn't quite complete my meteorology degree. I actually intended to after I graduated from college, I was continuing to take classes to complete my meteorology degree, but I just never quite got there. So are you are you a full-time storm chaser now or what's the day job? Storm chasing the day job? I wish storm chasing was my day job <laughs> or could provide a full-time income. However, I have not pursued it in that way. Over the years, I have definitely generated some income through chasing, through video sales and doing uh, we actually had a TV show, Peggy and I, the Twister Sisters, uh, back in 2008. So just bits and pieces here and there, additional income, supplemental income. Um, however, I really just do it because it's my passion. And it's what I love to do, not only just being out there and experiencing the storm, but documenting it and getting some of the best photographs I can get. Actually, these days, I'm beginning to explore ways to be able to sustain myself through that type of work outside of my other job. Um, and part of that is with my photography and actually exploring the realm of the new digital era, um, the Web3, the NFTs. I don't know if you've heard of NFTs, but I've actually been able to generate some income through that as well these days. So it's been a fun journey in that regard. Uh, however, that's not been my main goal. My main goal is just to get out there as much as I can as far as my day-to-day -day income, I've always had another job. Usually I've worked full time and it's been a journey. Back in the day, I was a chemist working full time, but I would still get out and chase as much as I could. These days, I actually ended up in corporate management. And then I went back to school for two years to study massage therapy and shiatsu therapy. So I now have my own practice, my own massage and shiatsu therapy practice. Having my own business does allow me to adjust my schedule, especially in the summertime, so I can get out there a little bit more full time during the actual season, which has been great. All right. You opened up a whole bunch of paths. We have to go back there, too. So, yes, in science. Yes, that you've done. Uh, B, <laughs> I was curious about the whole how do you break a break free. But let's start with the forecasting side of things. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have like a block of time that, say, from... April 1st to June 1st that you know this is prime season in the Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa. Do you l target a certain area that you kind of keep an eye on and could go chase? Generally speaking, since I live in the Minneapolis area in Minnesota, I definitely do get out more frequently in the upper Midwest. So that would include Iowa, Minnesota, I pass on Wisconsin because you can't see much out there with all the trees and the hills. Uh, but once in a while, I will end up in Wisconsin and maybe Illinois at times. And Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, those are all areas that are 
within a day's drive of where I'm living. So I definitely will tend to chase a little more in that upper Midwest, Northern Plains region. And we typically see more active severe, severe weather starting in late May into June. And then even throughout the summer, I've seen some pretty incredible storms and tornadoes in Iowa and Minnesota in July and August. So we do get, we continue to get those storms, not as frequently later into the summer. Whereas earlier in the season, we tend to see more active weather and tornadoes down in Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas in March, April, May. So typically these year, these days, I have been actually getting out there on the road as early as March. Um, and this year, I mean, there was that big tornado, sadly, unfortunately, in Winterset, Iowa that tracked for almost 70 miles. And that was in March. We don't typically see big tornadoes in Iowa like that in March. So it's been an interesting year so far. Uh, part of my other job duties is with Iowa PBS is girl state basketball. And, and that in the, in the state has this history of there's always, Oh, when's the snowstorm coming? Because back in like 1959, there was the giant snowstorm. Everybody was snowed in at the arena and they couldn't have, well, this year, on that championship Saturday, the conditions were there. The weather, the forecasters here in, in the Des Moines area were like, be weather aware on Saturday. And sure enough, mm -hmm. I saw one of the tweets from Winter Set, and I said to who I was with, I said, this is a big, I may have sworn, this is a big one coming. And mm -hmm. we were kind of in the path of that storm that day. So had you ventured down uh, knowing that that was coming? Yes, that was a scary day. And none of us actually really anticipated how big that tornado would be that did go through winter set and then tracked east, northeast through the Des Moines area. That day, it did look like we could see some tornadoes. Um, there was a low pressure and just the typical type of setup that we look for that produces tornadic storms. So based on my own forecasting and what the Storm Prediction Center was saying, I did end up chasing that day in Iowa. And honestly, which day was that? It was March. <laughs> March the 6th, I think is what, it, or, uh, it was... yeah. yeah, March the 5th, March 5th, okay. Saturday, March 5th. Okay. March 5th. Yes. I'd look for my calendar around my camera here. Sorry. <laughs> I know I was going to look that one up. I have so many dates in my head. It's hard to remember them all. Um, even though that one was recently. Yeah. March 5th. So I did head down to Iowa to chase that day and see what storms would develop. And on that day, I knew that storms would be moving quickly. Sometimes I don't chase that early in the season because of that reason. Storms were moving 55 miles an hour and over that for that afternoon, including that storm. And when you're chasing a storm and trying to navigate around it and keep up with it, it's almost impossible to keep up when they're moving that fast, especially going through a large metro area and going through small towns. We don't have any roads that are going to follow the storm exactly as that storm is moving. So I'm having to move, you know, generally east and north and east and north while that storm is just on a direct path northeast. And we don't want to, you know, be safe and not speed too much and try to pay attention to the laws and all that. So, um, yeah, that day was a hard day to keep up with storms. I was there when the storms initiated and there ended up being three different cells that had tornado warnings. I was actually watching one of them a little bit west of the storm that ended up going through winter set. And that one produced a brief tornado. And then I decided like all the other chasers to head for that cell that was near winter set. It looked like it was taking over and becoming the more dominant supercell. But at that point it was, I was a little bit behind it. So I did catch up to it, but I did not get into a position where I could actually see that tornado and witness what happened. Um, so I, I ended up like a lot of other chasers just right behind it that day. So when you're behind it, um, we have to do it generally speaking, because I know it's not the same. Is there an area you mentioned going east and north, east and north? Mm -hmm. What way do tornadoes generally move? And what is a rule you try to abide by in, in, in say getting the shot that's behind your shoulder? How are, you, how are you best positioning yourself to A, get a good picture, image, but mm -hmm. stay safe? Typically, I would like to be a little bit south and east of a storm 
And I'm going to give an example with a storm that is moving with directly east. Generally, storms are moving from west to east. Sometimes they might be moving southeast or northeast, but generally east. So if that storm is moving east, typically the inflow, the warm air coming into the storm is going to be coming from the south, southeast. And that's the area where there's going to be better visibility should a tornado develop, is on that southeast side of that storm. So typically I like to be a little bit ahead of it because um, those storms are moving and I don't want to lose it on the southeast side to get the best view of the storm itself and the mesocyclone as well as a tornado should it develop. And that is where you then are you, so what type of equipment are you using to get into place? I mean, is it off the shoulder? Is it on a tripod? Is it film first? Is it video? Oh, I, I try to capture both still photos, still photographs, as well as video of the storm while I'm chasing. So currently I have a few cameras. I don't have as many as some chasers do. Some are really decked out with GoPros all over their vehicle, pointing at every angle and then the GoPro 360 and being sure to capture that storm no matter where it is. It is challenging sometimes because there's so much driving involved with chasing that oftentimes I don't get a lot of opportunities to stop and capture some video or photos. That is why we do, and I do also, put a GoPro on my roof of my vehicle. So I have it on a mount where I can turn the GoPro. If I'm driving away from the storm, if I'm ahead of it and it's behind me, then I can turn that GoPro behind me and capture whatever's happening. And there have been times when it's captured quite a bit of action as I'm trying to position myself and I couldn't actually see what was happening while it was happening. So I have the GoPro, which I can turn in different directions, depending which direction I'm driving at the time. And then I've got my Sony camcorder, which I usually have on my dash. So if I'm driving towards the storm, if I'm coming from the south and it's right in front of me, I can get a good view with that Sony pointed, pointed forward through my dash or through my window. And then I have my Nikon DSLR, actually the D800. I haven't gone to mirrorless yet, which a lot of photographers have. <laughs> um, maybe someday. It's just time. It's just money, you yeah. know, more money yeah. to invest. Right. Um, so I've got my Nikon for my still images. And then I try to grab a few pictures on my cell phone too. So it's a constant um, challenge of really keeping in mind each of those devices that I've got going while I'm trying to navigate watch radar and make the best decisions I can make to navigate around the storm. The Let's talk about the storm behind you on your wall uh, or on your, yeah. your screen here. How did you get into position and where is this? Well, this storm was in Iowa. <laughs> this was, um, it was in Northeastern Iowa not Northeast, I'm sorry. This storm was in Northwestern Iowa. It was, I believe near Emmitsburg. And this, this storm was way back in 2004, actually. Um, this tornado, as you can see, is pretty cool. <laughs> this was actually the rope out phase of the tornado. The and robot phase? Is that what you said? The, oh, rope out. Oh, the rope, rope out. Got it. Want to make sure out. I heard that right. Sorry. Yes. So it was a thick, wider cone-shaped tornado at one point, and then oftentimes we'll see the tornado become a little more curvy and twisty, and, and the, vortex, the vortex become a lot smaller and more narrow as it's roping out, and that's right before it dissipates. Even though it looks like a small vortex at the end of that tornado during that phase, it can still be very, very intense, strong winds in there, so you still wanna keep your distance. Um, yeah, this, this tornado is pretty amazing. And as you can see, it's it looks white. I wanted to point out that the color of the tornado that we see is dependent on where the sun is relative to that storm. Some people don't understand that. Um, you know, like we see white tornadoes and black tornadoes. So if I'm east of the storm and I'm looking west, oftentimes because the storms are usually in the late afternoon and evening, the sun is behind it, backlighting it, creating a dark looking tornado or dark looking storm, high contrast with that sun behind it. So in this case, I was to the south of the storm looking north and a little bit southwest perhaps, a little southwest looking north, northeast. So that sun is lighting up the tornado a little bit more 
Um, it's not backlit based on the position of myself versus the storm. So if I'm to the west of the storm, we're going to get more of that white appearance as the sun lights up the tornado and the storm. You mentioned that you're on the southwest side of this, and earlier you had said you like to come in from the southeast. How do you quickly make that change or that audible of, I may have to change my strategy to get into the right spot? Are you using your eyeballs or are you having help with, uh, you know, forecasting and maybe understanding radar and what's going on? Right. While I'm on the chase, it's very important to watch radar. However, sometimes we don't get a signal. Even though these days we have great coverage for mobile data, we don't always have a signal out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> um, especially when there are big storms in the area, it can mess with our cell phone signals. So it's really important to know how to read the storm and also go visual. Since I started chasing way back in the late 90s, early 2000s, I didn't have a mobile phone at the time even. Um, it, it was I started chasing at a time when all I could do is go visual and maybe get a radar update from a friend on the, well, no, not even before I had cell phones, I couldn't even do that, right? right. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I feel like over the years, I've definitely developed that skill to really identify what's happening with the storm and where I wanna be relative to the action and what's going on um, and what I could see visually, knowing also my directions and where, how that storm is moving and where I wanna be relative to it. Um, so in this, so also now we can watch radar. So I am glancing at radar now and then, but I personally tend to be a little bit more visual reading the sky and reading the storm. It's important on radar, you can see very subtle things happening that you might not see visually. You can even see where the rotation is by looking at the velocity couplet on radar, which can be helpful in a situation where the storms have a lot of rain and you can't really see the wall cloud and see that area of rotation. If it's a big HP storm and everything's wrapped in the rain, it's good to know where that rotation is happening, not only for getting where you want to get, but also to stay safe and stay out of that area of the storm. Um, so if I need to reposition myself, it, it's really, I'll, I'll be honest with you, when I'm chasing, I'm trying to maintain my position, keep up with the storm, generally that south, southeast side, like I mentioned before. Um, and so if I end up on the southwest or the west side, it's usually because I just can't quite keep up or I stopped to take some photos mm -hmm. and the storm has continued to move. Now there are exceptions to that. There are times when the tornado is not wrapped in rain at all, like in this case, there's no rain wrapping around this tornado. So I can see it from the Southwest. There are days when there's just rain wrapping around most of that tornado. So in this position, I might not be able to see it at all. That actually happened last year in Iowa. I was east of the storm and I had to stay east, not even Southeast, but east in order to see anything. So that means I had to keep driving because it was kind of chasing me. So yeah, it wasn't the same coming up on your position. tail there. Yeah. But people who were south or even a little bit southeast were not able to see the tornado when it became this big wedge tornado because that rain, because of the rotation of the storm and all the rain that was present was getting wrapped around that tornado. So there's always just little things, you know, that I'm thinking about not only the lighting on the storm, but how much rain is there and if it's wrapping around and how I want to try to reposition myself based on all that stuff happening in the moment. I left television news on a, at a time when group chat was just starting between the meteorologists at, at television stations and Twitter was just beginning and that was providing some information. What do you do when you see something in terms of who are you calling or radio radioing or communicating with of I'm at Emmitsburg. I have a, a funnel. I have a funnel on the ground, terrain on the ground off highway R 52 or what do you do? Well, back in the day before we had our cell phones, we had ham radios and I actually did have a ham radio license at the time which allowed us, allowed me and other chasers to call in reports through the ham radio system. If we were noticing a funnel developing or rotating wall cloud or a tornado touching down to try to get those reports back to the National Weather Service. These days we have many different ways that we can report what we're seeing from the field so that the National Weather Service can get that information. Um, and a lot of us tend to actually use Twitter. Act, um, it's a 
it's not the best way to report, but it is a good way to report. If you don't have the number to the local National Weather Service on you and you really want to get that report in quickly, you can hashtag or actually say, you know, tag like with the at symbol, tag the National Weather Service um, office, hopefully at the location you're at. So I would probably choose Des Moines, Iowa, if I was in Iowa for it. Mm -hmm. So at NWS Des Moines and then. Usually it'll pop up, you know, the tag will pop up for the one you're looking for. You may have used and, it a time or two. Yeah. Yeah. And so just reporting what I'm seeing. And, you know, if you have an image to post, then I think they take you more seriously because you can get a lot of reports from people that don't really know what they're looking at. So I know it's important for the National Weather Service to discern which reports are more valid. Um, so if you do have a spotter license and they know that, then they they know that you know what you're looking at. So it depends on what reports they get coming in. But if you have a photo, clearly they can see what's going on and say, yes, that's definitely a funnel. We need to issue a warning on that now if they haven't already been aware of it based on the radar. The issue is that sometimes radar scans um, don't always show what's happening. They're a little bit delayed. And depending where that storm is, if it's if it's way out far away from a radar, that radar is only going to see upper levels of that storm. It's not going to see the lower levels. So it's hard for them to know exactly what's happening at that ground level, which is why it's important to receive those reports. Um, so, yeah, you can report what you're seeing via Twitter and tagging the Weather Service, um, calling the Weather Service directly, the one that's nearest to the area that storms are happening is probably the best way, um, or also still using um, spotter network. There is the spotter network where you can also report um, from the field through different through apps. You're allowed to report if you're a spotter and have gone through the Skywarn training. So that's another really good way. And you've got you have your spotter license that you referred to. Yes, it's um, just going through the training and then you receive uh, number essentially like spotter id identification and they've had you recorded as a spotter so they know if you can give them your identification then they trust your report a little bit more than coming from the general public right uh, you'll see that on the weather service amateur report which mm -hmm. translates it's not you mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and these funny. days too i think i i've noticed with so many chasers out there they tend to trust chasers quite a bit too, because we know what we're doing out there as well. And if you say you're a chaser, they're like, okay, you know, I think yeah. you probably know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag legit. Uh, I'll see it on Twitter occasionally uh, through market to market, whether it's Kansas or Oklahoma or somewhere else. And they'll say, oh, Jim Cantori is in our hotel, is at the hotel, or a bunch of spotters are at this hotel that's usually an indication of a whole bunch of you are kind of like-minded right now that something's going to happen. And as a regular person, I'm, I'm going to have to be very weather aware and concerned for that day. Is that an accurate way to read that forecast? Um, yeah, you definitely, if you, if you hear people are in the area that <laughs> to be there to document some big storms, you better uh, pay attention and have your, phone ready. You know, there's so many apps these days that can warn us if there's um, a watch or a warning issued in your area. So if you suspect there's going to be storms, it's important to pay attention and be aware that day. That's uh, good advice. Uh, I, I want to go back. The, the reason I even found you in the first place, Melanie, last week you had posted something from North Iowa where you were at, uh, which is my transition to this. Uh, I saw a video yesterday in Palmer, Iowa, surveillance camera at a church, and the, the twister is moving across the screen, heading towards a road. I'm seeing two cars basically look like they're on a collision course for that tornado, <laughs> Tell me why that's a bad idea and what I should do uh, if I do see something like that, if I'm not a professional yeah. uh, storm chaser. Right. It's, it's very important. I, I can pull that up if you'd like. You oh, you have the up. video from... Uh, oh, just the, the, one of the photos. Yes. Well, that's the one that we... Yes, that's the one. We're going to get to that. But uh, okay, <laughs> I'm on that road off, over your right shoulder. What do I do seeing that coming at me? Right. If... Okay, so there was actually a video from the Winterset, Iowa tornado of some people, some locals who lived in the area, 
and it was interesting to watch and important to learn lessons from it. Um, they were sitting there. If, first of all, if you're in your vehicle on the road, as we're talking about, and you see a tornado, or you know there's a tornado warning, and you see a big storm, but maybe don't see the tornado, first of all, don't drive into that storm. Um, and then pay attention. If that storm is moving, you know, getting bigger and closer to you, you want to turn around and go the opposite way. Um, it's best if you can turn to get out of the way, out of the path of the storm. As I said, storms are often moving to the east in some format, east, northeast, southeast. So going east away from it is good, but it's still going to catch up to you potentially. So if you can drop south and if you have enough time to go south and get out of the way, then you can get out of the path of that storm as well, instead of having to just keep going east and east and east to try to outrun it. So it's really important to pay attention, at least in visually for a second, see how it looks like it's moving. Uh, what happened in this video with the local residents, um, they were in the car and they saw the tornado and it was a little bit away from, you know, little distance from them at the time. And they're sitting there filming it. This is another thing that can happen these days. Anyone, everyone has a camera with their cell phone and tornadoes are fascinating. So a lot of people are mesmerized by the tornado and they want to film it. You know, they want to get it on camera and maybe their photo or their video will be on the news. You know, it's exciting. Um, so that can happen also. So they're just sitting there. They were in their car filming it and it was getting closer and closer. And I, one of the people said, oh, it's not really moving. And the reason it looked like it wasn't moving it was, was because it was coming directly at them. So that can happen where it's just getting bigger. It looks like it's getting bigger and that's because it's coming towards you. But it didn't look like it was moving one direction or another because it was coming right at them. And the kid, I believe, actually figured that out and said, it's getting closer. We have to go. We have to go. And so they, it was funny. They were all super calm. Actually, most of them were pretty calm. And the, I think they backed up and they should have turned around and just drove off as fast as they could, but they backed up and let it pass. So they were right on the edge of it. And luckily they backed up enough so that they were just outside of the path and it was moving slightly northeast. So after it moved, after it passed by, they were out of the path of it at that point. But if it had been moving east, they would have had to keep backing up and backing up and backing up and turn around and get out of there. So it's really important to pay attention just to the movement and the motion. If it looks like it's getting bigger, it's probably coming right at you. So try to get south or out of the path of it as fast as you can, if you're in your vehicle. Um, if you're stuck in a position where there's just absolutely no way to outrun it or get out of the path, which in that case, that tornado was moving over 55 miles an hour forward motion speed. Um, so you could get caught in a situation like that, especially if you're in town and you can't get out, find a road and, um, then, you know, then you want to get to shelter as fast as you can. Um, the danger of being in your vehicle is that it can get tossed by the tornado. And in that case, obviously, it's dangerous for you. If there's a ditch nearby, it sounds scary. And personally, I wouldn't want to do this. But, you know, get down in that ditch and try to cover yourself, um, cover your head. Because it's really your goal is to not get hit by debris. Um, you know, personally, I would still try to outrun it. But if you just can't, find somewhere low, somewhere just trying to get out of the debris. Um, and then if you're at home, um, if there's a building nearby, if there's like a building right there or house, I would probably try to get into that house instead of laying in the ditch mm -hmm. and hopefully get into the basement or into an interior bathroom, into the bathtub, cover yourself with a mattress. Probably heard that before. Again, the whole idea is just getting away from any potential debris that's flying around. When you've been driving, I'm sure you have seen, you mentioned the, the people taking their phone and trying to get video or pictures. I'm guessing you've seen uh, someone on their porch a time or two watching the storm. Is that just an Iowa Midwest thing <laughs> <laughs> where we all, let's just go out and watch this thing go on by. <laughs> Oh, yeah, definitely. All the time I see local residents out watching and looking at the sky, especially if there have already been warnings issued or the tornado sirens are blaring. There are people out there looking for it, wondering where it's at. 
So if you're at home and you hear those tornado sirens, I recommend not going out to look for it because it means that it's coming towards you. You need to get into shelter as fast as you can and stay there until you know it's safe. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely, you see a lot of videos these days of people at home going out to their porch, you know, and the tornado comes by and like starts ripping the roof off their house. I'm like, what are you doing? You need yeah. to get down in the basement. Yeah. Right. No, I know. All right. You mentioned Twister Sisters. That was, uh, what, tell me what that was about. Back in the early 2000s, when I first started chasing more seriously, after I was done with college and I had gone through all my training and forecasting education, I started getting out there to chase and really just get into it. And I met Peggy Willenberg. Actually, she was teaching the Skywarn class that I went to to become a storm spotter. We connected right away. We were two women in this field, especially at the time that was more male dominated. We didn't see a lot of women out there chasing back then. And we just got along really well. We ended up chasing together and became known as Twister Sisters. So we, we ended up doing a lot of fun stuff over the years. We ended up doing a lot of public speaking events, both with children and adults. Um, anything from severe weather safety to just talking about the chase or even the forecasting and the science behind storms. We also just would chase all the time and ended up in a couple documentaries, including a National Geographic Tornado Hunters documentary. And we ended up with our own reality show for one season, which was pretty exciting and a lot of work. That was, that was a lot of work, but a lot of fun, too. And Peggy and I... Oh, go ahead. I can only imagine the producing the storm chaser. You're follow. You're trying to predict where they're going to go and have crews in position and keep those crews safe. Yeah, I would imagine that would have been quite the. Uh, that would have been a lot of work. Yeah, they were with us. The production crew is with usually in our vehicle, chasing with us, and then they had an extra vehicle that would follow along. Um, it was quite the production, and it was yeah, it was fun. It was fun. And you also now have picked up, uh, you mentioned women in the industry, Girls Who Chase. What's that about? Right. Girls Who Chase is a new initiative that was founded by Jennifer Walton. The intention of Girls Who Chase is to really elevate the voices and content of female storm chasers, as well as to inspire and empower both girls and women to pursue the sciences, to pursue weather, and storm chasing, if that's what they're interested in. Ultimately, the idea is um, to just help support other women who are interested in this field and to encourage them and to, like I said, um, get their voices heard and their content seen. Jennifer started this initiative because she found as a new chaser in the field in the past couple of years, it was more challenging for her as a woman to actually get out there and get recognized and make sales and compete with all the men that are out there in the field. And that was her experience, not necessarily my experience, but because of what she experienced, she really felt strongly about helping to empower other women. And part of that is actually helping to educate people, to help guide them in the process. What we have found so far in meeting other women who really love storms and want to chase or learn how to chase is that they've been interested for a long time, but they just didn't really know how to get started or where to go. And um, a lot of times they were looking for other women to connect with and to learn from and to just get out there and feel confident about chasing rather than connecting with men out there. They're sometimes a little, they're a little crazy. You know, sometimes we are too, but yeah, it's just about connecting with other women who are interested and ultimately building the confidence in girls who are young, who are interested in the sciences, maybe not only weather, but other sciences as well, to know that they can do it if that's what their dream is and that's what they want to do. So in that effort, we're helping to get more exposure for women, for their content, for their photos and video, which are just as good as a lot of the men out there, helping women to figure out how to, how to get those video sales and how to, you know, just do more with their work that they they have a passion for and also that education piece of helping other girls and women learn how to forecast and just being able to have the guidance to learn what they want to learn. I, I love the initiative because I mean, I, 
if you had to wage a guess right now on the percentage of women versus men in chasing, is it, is it better than it was when you started? As far as women who are out there chasing storms and in meteorology in general, it definitely has improved. There are definitely more women out there than when I first started back in the 90s. Back in that day, I honestly recall only seeing like three or four other women out there, one of those being Peggy. And so it was interesting with Peggy and I as the Twister sisters, I have been approached by many women who have commented that we helped inspire them to follow their dreams in this field because they saw us out there through the media, um, which gave them that confidence like, oh, look at these two women are doing it. I can do it too. So it's really an honor. You know, I really feel blessed that just by doing what I love doing, it's helped to inspire other girls out there. These days, um, I definitely see a lot more women. However, even though there's, a, I think, quite a few more women out there chasing, there's still not a lot that are being recognized, which is part of what we want to help change, um, to help see them, to help hear them, and, and like, recognize other women out there. Part of that is also just, in some ways, I think, I think there are a lot of men who just feel really confident, like, hey, look at me, look at what I'm doing, this is so great. But women tend to be a little quieter, and like not really put themselves out there, their work out there as much. Um, so I'm starting to see a few pop up as far as like really putting themselves out there and like, hey, look what I'm doing, this is awesome. And it's, that's what's fun, too, about this Girls Who Chase is connecting with all those people and the people who have been out there for many years that I've never seen or heard of because they're just kind of they're there, but they're not on social media, you know, right. and they're not we, we haven't had a way to connect yet. So, well, you, this uh, hopefully help will maybe inspire if people want to get a hold of you. Um, well, what's a good way to do that? Uh, your website is what? Our website is girlswhochase.com. And we did just launch a Discord group so that we can all chat on the mm -hmm. Discord. And we also have a Patreon account at Girls Who Chase. With the Patreon account, we are offering just some more services. I'm actually doing some forecasting to help people learn, you know, for each chase where I'm going to target that day, as well as some classes we'll be hosting and developing about forecasting, about photography. So we have some different offerings there. We definitely intend to also provide education outside of paid, a paid membership. But currently um, on Patreon, it's a way for people to be able to support us um, as we get this launched and rolling and um, also providing some extra services. So, but the website is the, where you can find everything, what's going on and the links to uh, everything else as well. Another thing that we like to do is if you are out there chasing or you have questions or if you have photos, you can tag at Girls Who Chase on Twitter and on Instagram, and then we'll share your content. So it's about getting that exposure for other women out there. I'll write that down so we can share to that. One last thing before we go, uh, Melanie. Mm -hmm. Is it true when you have to listen as well? Is it do you know when you start hearing either super quiet or you have you heard the train come through that is talked about with the tornado? Yeah, the, the train sound that people talk about when a tornado passes closely is something that I haven't really honestly experienced. Part of the reason is because I try not to get too close to the tornado. I try to stay safe. There are some chasers that we see over and over who are almost in the tornado, and I suspect that they hear it a little more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> but one day, so the, the day I was probably closest to a big, strong tornado was July 8th in 2020 in Ashby, Minnesota. That tornado passed right by, definitely within a quarter mile, perhaps even closer. And it was an EF4 tornado. And that, I heard it, but you know, it just sounded like what you would think, really windy. Um, that didn't strike me as being the train passing by. It was just this like low rumble, windy kind of sound. 
But what struck me the most that day when I was that close to a strong tornado was the smell. So in my video, <laughs> if you ever watch that, my, my YouTube channel is Melanie Metz Storm Chasing. Um, if you ever watch that video, you'll, there's a point where I get out of the car and I say, oh, you can smell it. And people laughed so much every time they hear me say that. But really that's what struck me was the smell or near that tornado rather than the sound because it just smelled, well, you know, it was in July and it smelled like earth and manure, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> fresh manure, but it was really strong. And it wasn't just that manure. It was that mixed with an earthy smell because it had been on the ground a little while, just tearing up the soil and the trees and, you know, the earth essentially. And it really created this really pungent smell in the air. Mm. Well, we'll have to leave it at that, but I exactly know what you're talking about in terms of th there is smells to different situations and, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a pre thunderstorm, you can smell something, but obviously in a tornado, when you're mixing everything up, that happens too. All right, Melanie Metz, I appreciate the time. Thank you. Good luck in your chasing here as we get ready for, uh, let's hope a calm season for those who are injured, but good for you in chasing and finding the next storm. Thank you, Paul. Stay safe out there. <laughs> My thanks to Melanie Metz. Again, that's Girls Who Chase. And uh, you can find her on that one episode or one season of the show, Twister Sisters. Good luck while you are chasing storms and staying out of harm's way. Good luck to you. And we'll see you next Tuesday with another installment of the MTOM Show podcast.